As he said, my name is Jelons, and um, I'm with Statoil. And I've been uh, asked to talk about wallet fatigue and particularly how international standards handle wallet fatigue. Um, and this is a brief breakdown of uh, how I've structured the presentation. Um, I will quickly give a quick explanation on what's what wallet fatigue is. For those of you who not are, uh, are not too certain or need a quick recap, um, then look, let's look at what are the international standards for wellheads, sub C, and then touch on how they handle wellhead fatigue. Um, for some reason, which I will explain a bit later, I will start talk then start talking about the design approach of these industry standards, and then I will discuss whether they are suitable for fatigue and finally I will give a quick look ahead of my perspective on it at least. Um, I, ver I disappointed my teacher when I uh, told her at high school that I was going to go into engineering because she really thought I would be studying history. I don't know why. But here today, back in 1950, you know, always check today's uh, date, what's what happened. Uh, there's an interesting uh, sidekick here. For the first time ever, Norway Norwegian ski jumpers went to London and they brought her on snow and they carried out a ski jump competition in, in London. It was a great success and it was uh, deemed to be the one of the um, uh, upcoming uh, major sporting uh, features of the UK. It never happened again. But I'm certain that that day, um, Everybody thought that they were, they'd seen a glimpse of the future and the way ski jumping history was heading, definitely. They were very convinced. Uh, two years later, mankind found a way to start mass producing or make artificial snow. So they had um, a game changer. I just brought this for... Um, a synonym for an idea of what can happen. We're curr currently writing history, we're currently doing the longest, the deepest, the fastest, and all of that. Um, what will happen in the future, we really don't know. And I personally don't believe that standards will pull us there or take us there. So, back to wellness fatigue. What is it really? It's, this is the, uh, an illustration for the from the Macondo um, investigation. Report. They've got a lot of good, good illustrations for, for explaining. So what you see here is the BOP, the drilling BOP on top of the wellhead. I, if, you, if you have no previous knowledge to subsea and you look at this, and you, you would understand loads involved and the weights involved, you would and, and you would be a construction type of engineer, you look at this and it's like, it's wrong. You can't do this. It's a massive weight on top of a very slender construction. Don't don't go do that. Well, that's what we're doing. And the point is that the BOP, which is the large yellow structure here, um, is run and retrieved from the rig with a riser. And the rig isn't stationary. It comes and it leaves, and it's 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 got a dynamic uh, motion. It moves, and this riser system with its weight will transmit those loads down to the stationary and, and not moving wellhead or the top of the well, rather. And um, the wellhead can be seen here in this area. And this is the BOP, and you can see the riser going all the way through the water column. So um, the signs of risers are um, known to be fatigue prone. They are fatigue uh, loaded, dynamically loaded. There is no logic that it, that, that suddenly stops when you comes from the yellow part to the turquoise part here, that there is no dynamics, no loads, and so on. We've had fatigue-related uh, failures of wellheads before. And this picture is actually quite old, and uh, it's from a paper in 82, I think. And it happened in 81. Um, this is in the very verge of subsea developments. So, um, and that scared up the industry or, or the people working with this at the time. And they 
debated this and, and it was a matter of a lot of papers and discussions on conferences and stuff for like roughly 10 years. Um, and they imposed some design changes to Wellads that, that they thought solved this. Um, I'd like to take this point in time and, and remind everyone that fatigue is a time or usage based degradation mechanism. There are orders as well. So there is, there is, um, there is uh, more static failure mechanisms or, or things that are not time dependent or use dependent that you need to check for as an engineer. And once you cater for those, you can move on to the time or usage based ones, like fatigue. Um, now, let's find the standard for um, a wellhead, which are going to be, uh, and then we're going to look at how it de deals with fatigue uh, in particular, which is a time dependent degradation or user usage dependent degradation. This is um, not recently updated, but um, I think it's valid from um, the situation from before uh, what Jens, Hen Jens Henrik was discussing earlier today. It's basically the whole oil and gas industry's um, portfolio of standards. And um, you can find uh, a platform and a subsea installation here. So probably we're down here somewhere. And if we zoom in on it, we can find some standards that are applicable. Uh, here we have something called the ISO 13628-4, subsea wellheads and tree equipment. Right, that's the one. Um, and I will highlight a couple of others, uh, particularly this one, which is DAS7, Completion Work of Riser Systems. You may remember um, Hual earlier today talked about the, the um, multi-use or this, the, this um, workover system that was going to be a, um, a unit when go for all kinds of different types of um, well systems. And that's governed by, by this. Okay, so we got it. Here is a code break. So we are mimicking very much the um, approximately the scope of the DNV report earlier today. And, and this is an illustration showing which standard covers what in that system. So we have the wallet here and the Christmas tree. Uh, that's uh, dash four. And here we have the riser system, which is the workover system. What is it? Remember the, the Macondo picture I started off with? That's not, that's, that's up here. That's the marine drilling ri uh, riser system. That, that's part of the rig. Nobody has talked about rigs today. So we want to standardize and, and, and in industrialize subsea. And a large portion of that needs to go with rigs. And that's what basically I'm talking about today. Who's standardizing rigs? Who makes the decision for the size and weight of a BUP? Nobody in this room. Investors. They look at where are the, 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 where are the, the oil discoveries going to go? How deep are they? Let's specify a rig that can work on that depth. That's, that's how it, I think it runs. And then years later, an oil company gets involved and a very specific field gets involved and here's the rig. So um, there's a famous um, Norwegian co uh, comedian that, that has this um, Russian submarine character. And he says the phrase in Norwegian, du kan ikke en grense under van. Um, it means that you can't see the boundaries between countries under water driving a submarine. So he ended up in Norway. Uh, these, this equipment and these forces, which could, could cause deterioration or we need to design against these forces, have no idea about these code breaks. They're made by humans, by us, and these forces do not respect them. They would cross any border here at any given time, I feel like. So that's what I would be terming system loads, system effects. And um, very bluntly, standards today does not cater for that. We, 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 we don't have a, a set of codes, either it's ISO or API, that today takes into that, that into, an, uh, into account and enables us to deal with system loads in a very efficient and systematic manner across the industry. And I think that's the root cause for a lot of the reasons why we're not too happy currently with 
costs and time and delivery and standardization and so on. That's part of it, at least. I, th I think this is uh, just showing that currently the ISO and the API codes which are currently out there for the equipment that I'm talking about is identical, almost. Um, you see, in, when you look at this, uh, whether you have an ISO or an API code, you can look at the parentheses. It says it's identical, or in some cases it says it's modified, because API has uh, had the right to mend codes that they issue as API, but that right doesn't go the other way around. Quick timeline. We started off um, about the failure, which happened, and uh, the next 10 years there was a lot of papers and attention towards uh, the fact that, well, it's taken from shore and put them in the subsea would be dynamically loaded or cyclic loaded. And then, um, 92, we released the first uh, code for subsea wellheads. Um, and during the course of these, this activity, w it was concluded and, and uh, BP did a um, work on, these on standardization and, and a claimed uh, design uh, considerations that you need to take on a subsea wellhead. And fatigue was one of the two most important ones. The industry put out a code that doesn't even consider it. And carried on doing that all the way through and are still not doing it. Um, I won't go into all of these details, but we reaffirmed it and it's uh, still running. Um, I'll point to um, a GAP that's currently ongoing. It's just reiterated in phase two and it's now is run by 16 or 17 operators and DNV is a um, is, uh, um, facilitator, I think. And, uh, and that's operators talking about well at fatigue or well subsea well structural integrity, um, trying to, to see if they can, can come up with a common grounds for it and how to breach all these codes. In dash four it states, and, and you, can you can read it directly out, the effects of external loads, um, like bending moments and tension and such, on the assembly or components are not explicitly addressed in this part of ISO. As equipment covered by this part of the code are exposed to external loads. So they're, they're actually saying that they, they are loaded, but we do not address it. They point to dash seven, may be used to define the structural strength design. And that seems like a good way of, let's point to somebody who does. But that's, to me, a not a good solution, and then here's why. Dash four and dash seven, that's short for these two codes, they are fundamentally different in their design methodology. Dash four is, is what we could, they're applying what we call a rated load method. That basically, you can, you just um, decide up front what should this um, piece of equipment um, endure? How much should it um, be able to take? And then you just make your design and you check that, yeah, I'm within limits. Basically, it's like saying with the car analogy, the speed limit in Norway is 80 or 90, 90 kilometers per hour. So the, the requirement for any car is that it should be able to drive 90 kilometers per hour. So on the uh, other side, it's dash seven, which says you need to find how much, it, how, what's the speed of your car and you'd have to put a sticker on it saying how much, what, what speed does it have? I mean, how much can this equipment take before it breaks down for any kind of failure mechanism, including fatigue? So, if you do this, you can put various components together in a system. You can establish your system loads, and then you go through the system and check that none of the system loads at that location would exceed the capacity of the car or the component. It's fundamentally different. So if you want to take external loads and apply the dash seven logic on dash four equipment, um, it's apples and bananas, it doesn't fit, fit together. You can't use, uh, they don't have the, the capacity you need to check ex system loads. So my point is that that escape there is flawed, it's flawed logic. 
Um, here in Norway, the well integrity definition has a very important statement at the end, and that is um, throughout the life cycle of the well. And the way, I mean, it's not, it won't be a, a long argument to pull this into timely, time dependent or user dependent failure mechanisms or degrading me me mechanisms, and in this case, include fatigue. So basically, you could read this at um, uh, throughout the life of the cycle of the well, in, I mean, basically you can read it as fatigue. Because fatigue, if you have cycle loading, you will increase the fatigue damage throughout the use of a well or anything else. So, I guess you've guessed my answer is, is this, um, these international codes um, sufficient for meeting uh, regulatory expectations for subsea wallets in Norway? And my answer is no. Basically, quickly, we do not address it. We require it. So we need to have uh, additional requirements on top of that code to, be to meet uh, the uh, well integrity requirements. So they can be company specific, they can be national, they can be all kinds of things, but there, there needs to be something else but the current API ISO code for wallets to meet that, that um, um, regulatory uh, requirement for well integrity. Because the code even states that there are external loadings. Um, I think that, that uh, Peter in this case can impact the current status on codes. I think, I think you can. Um, I think we're doing what we can and we're, we are, we're not giving up. But we see, um, I see wellhead products being designed and manufactured for a global market. Jens Henrik pointed about, about how we were able to through the NORSOC and then ISO to influence North Sea and Norwegian um, applications to the, um, on to, onto the API code and they were jointly issued. Um, obviously the energy driving fatigue comes from environment, weather. And, and, and these conditions are very different across the, the, the globe. So if, if we want to influence that for that reason we need to have uh, more impact on the, the new codes coming out now. And you could you saw earlier today how the code shifting is focusing over to API and they're currently revising a lot of codes. So we very quickly now will be set uh, with ISO and revised API codes and they will in some cases be very be moving away from each other and they, they don't, uh, they're not identical anymore. So we have approximately 90 buyers of wellheads, and we, we have four and five, four or five per producers, manufacturers. Um, so it's not going to be an easy task to unify the requirements amongst 90 buyers or so. Um, but that JIP that I pointed to earlier is potentially such an area where lo the, the largest of the 90 buyers buying the most wellheads are, are represented and working towards looking at if there's a chance that we can unify um, and u on top of the standard use uh, common grounds. But I think that apart from the Dash 7 code, or which is 17G with the API series, nobody of the other codes uses a, a um, rated, no, a, a you are everybody else's uh, code are based on rated capacity, rated uh, load uh, method. I think we need to go into a limit state approach and it doesn't seem like uh, there's much interest in API in moving in that direction. And I think governmental pressure in UK US is needed to move this in a different direction. And I think it can serve the industry well because um, down the route of supplier chain, you can make a high commodity piece of equipment and you just state your, your limitations for that equipment. Uh, and the more up in the system level you get that part integrated, the more um, you do the checking on the use rather than on the design. So you design something and you tell everybody buying it what it can take. And in that way we know the safety margins on a system level. Because you can compare two things from two different manufacturers with 
they can both they are rated for 10 to 1000 ksi when will it really break what is the top speed of these two cars they can all drive drive in 80 kilometers per hour but you don't know the top speed and that's very important when you're looking at um, accidental scenarios and combination of loads that might happen to uh, to um, to combine but you're not planning to do it and with that i think i end my my presentation thank you lorenz uh, is there any questions <laughs> none in the back there Uh, Trond Peter from Four Uh Do you think the lack of attention, uh, both in government uh, regulatory bodies and API system, is due to the fact that there are very, very few known well ed failures due to fatigue? Is that, is that the argument you meet when you try to implement this? Um, yes, uh, partly. Not totally, but um, if there's been a, a major accident related to these failure mechanisms, I'm sure the situation would be absolutely different. But I think the whole idea behind both uh, regulatory operators and all bodies in working here is that to avoid this type of thing, a major accident, because the worst case scenario here is, is very dramatic. So we shouldn't be having anything close to a failure or a... So, um, so that, yes. If if it had happened, we the, the 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 shift would have been dramatic, definitely. But I think, I think, also a lot of it is has to do with with um, um, how we we how the business works with contracts and awards and how we deal with each other and and standardization. All that's been talk of today. Um, it's it's very convenient to have the pressure loading only to deal with. And I mean, it's very easy. Uh, yep, we've got these five candidates of 10K wellheads, but my point about the system loads not respecting that, we make that distinction. We're just going to look at pressure. Uh, the loads doesn't care. They will go there anywhere. Anyway, and it's very complicated. It's complicated things in the interaction between all parties in the business if we just throw in all these various uh, assessments. But they're there, so we can't. I mean, th the convenience of that can't uh, can't uh, be the argument for not doing it either. So, but I think that's also part of why it hasn't been uh, rectified. Thank you for that one. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm a great supporter of the work being done in the DNV JIP. I think it's very important. Uh, but I think we had to understand that the U.S. business model um, is, is different from ours. That they like go no go decisions, equipment which is fit for purpose. They don't like everything assessed and sort of risk based assessment on every case. It involves complexity. It involves judgment. It involves business uncertainty, restrictive practices. Wouldn't it be better if the industry could simply deal with this problem by, by designing an improved wellhead that could deal with fatigue under any circumstances? You know, wh why can't we move in that direction and then we can all move on basically with a, uh, a more robust design that's fit for purpose for every, every situation? Uh, yes, I... I um I agree, and I understand the differences in business model in the States um, and the mentality. <laughs> and as I said, it's designed for a global market, and very much of these designs are done in exactly the States. They're calling the shots. We're not going to get a North Sea wellhead out there, and it's going to breach all the thoughts earlier today of standardization. Um, yes, I would love for, her, for a... Um, a wellhead that wouldn't just that would we would design ourselves away from this. But 
that would mean that we would have to get some kind of control on future trends on BOPs and rigs. Um, there is no link between the subsea, the science, and the, the, the future and the developments of BOP sizes, which are very, very much um, defining the loads that we're seeing. And just try and get grasp, and, you know, try and coordinate that. So I think, um, I think, the, uh, I think the, the, the pragmatic default then, the second next best thing, is to at least know what this wallet can take. And then look at the rig options you have, and then you can make a judgment and you can move on. And it's not going to affect anybody else but the operator who's responsible for that putting these systems together. The operator picks a rig and he has a well and he joins them together. So I think that that responsibility is, uh, needs to stay with the operator. So the rest of the business is not going to see a tremendous amount increase in assessment and risk analysis and stuff, I think. But uh, yeah, I would love that wellhead. <laughs> Thank you. Time for one or two more questions. Uh, you're talking about uh, system standard or standardization or looking at the, the broader picture. And it doesn't fit very well with the way standard standards are organized. Uh, it's in silos. So That's my point exactly. And and the question was? <laughs> <laughs> no, the question is, I think we discussed it earlier as well. Someone has mentioned uh, the shipping industry, where and uh, Roal mentioned the specifications from the company, which might be one way of getting around this, because the ultimate responsibility is still on the operator to... Uh, to comply with the regulations and have containment. So. Mm. But the system engineering, we, we've been discussing that in the subsea group for many, many years, but it's it's outside the group, so uh, I struggle as well to uh, to get a grasp on that. Agree. But, but that's again why I really would like to emphasize that if if everybody started to waive their limitations, this is how much I can do. I don't. I have no idea where I'm going to be used yet, but that's my limits. And somebody picks that piece of up and puts it into use somewhere. And in doing so, you're responsible for that action, and you have the information you need to check whether this is safe or not. Because you can take, you can compile a system of, it, of a set of components, valves and various pieces that you buy on, and you put it together for for a, for a purpose. And you can restructure those same components because they have standardized interfaces and all that and standardized material. But on a system level with loads that that system would generate in itself, one set of uh, one compilation could be safe, another one can be absolutely unsafe. And there is no standard for that. And it's you can't standardize it. <coughs> but but waiving your limits towards failure mechanisms of or, or of failure modes is sort of a um, protecting everybody making equipment from getting involved in that system um, consideration. So up to now we've been, the standards has been good because they've, uh, they've set various pressure limits and all kinds of things so anybody can make us uh, an equipment and put it out on the market with that and they're fitting the, the, the envelope. And then system uh, aspects are, are lost, and, and but we gain that we don't have to do qualification engineering per project, right? But we we can still achieve that. You can do your design and qualification once, and just put it out on the market. But you open up for for sound system approaches on very case specific uh, applications. So that's my 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 key point. And Dash Seven is do is doing it, has been doing it, and hopefully it will do it as Seventeen G. Thank you. I think we have to stop there. Thank you for your presentation. Sure. Thanks.